Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Julia. I'm part of the food team here. I'm very excited to welcome our guest chef today, Alice Medrich, to the uh, teaching kitchen here at Google. Um, Alice is a award-winning cookbook author. She is a dessert chef, a chocolatier, a teacher. She got her start uh, when she opened a dessert and chocolate shop in Berkeley in the 70s. She is, um, one of her claims to fame, let's say, is introducing the chocolate truffle that we all know and love to America, so thank you for that. <laughs> Um, Alice is here today uh, showing some recipes from her newest book, Flavor Flowers, which is her 10th cookbook. And it was the recipient of the Best New Cookbook Award um, from the James Beard Foundation last year in the dessert and baking category. So thank you so much for being here today, Alice. We're very excited to have you. And uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start out with this yogurt tart. It's a um, nine and a half inch tart pan. This dough that we're about to make is fairly sticky. And so just in case, I've greased it. Um, I've greased it thoroughly, but not heavily. So I just want, and especially in these little crenellated areas, because we really want it to release and be beautiful. So I've taken the time to do that. You can do it with softened butter. You can do that with spray. If you like spray, or you can do it with oil, whatever is going to get it greasy. Also, when it comes time to picking, um, uh, equipment. I personally love a pan that's not dark because with a, a pan that's got this finish on it, you can get even browning and it won't brown too fast on the outside before the inside is done. And one of the, the key things about whole grains is they taste better when they're fully baked and you get a little toastiness. So starting with the crust, I've got oat flour and uh, sugar and a little rice flour. The rice flour acts as a sort of neutral ingredient that highlights the oats stretches them out a little bit, a teeny, teeny bit of baking soda to give a little lightness to the dough, a little salt. I like having a group that isn't scared of a scale. So 85 grams, you know, American bakers have taken a really long time to get used to the scale. 85 grams is six, is, uh, I, this is almost, didn't get some, but just three tablespoons of cream cheese. Sorry. Um, so before I do, before I drop in the wet stuff, let's just mix it all around. The idea of mixing the dry before adding the gooey stuff is to make sure that the salt and the soda and anything that's strong like that doesn't end up in one place in the tart pan, right? So usually we whisk up the dry ingredients, and some of these flours clump a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Just so eyeball me the three tablespoons of that. Baking's very precise. We don't eyeball at all. <laughs> no, no eyeballing. Um, so this, this pastry could be made in the food processor or by hand, but we don't want to wash the food, food processor. And we don't want to have it buzzing away in this whole demonstration. So as long as you start with soft butter and soft cream cheese, it's really easy to mix by hand. And it's also a good demonstration of the fact that because we don't have any gluten, it's not a wheat flour, there's no danger. If you make pastry, you know the thing. I think, is this enough? Um, let me see if I got the amount right. Is that about three tablespoons? Um, six, six, two tablespoons, good. Okay. So it doesn't matter how much we handle this, because when, when you handle a wheat flour pastry, it, there's a risk of it getting tough and cardboardy. Without any gluten, it just doesn't matter. So I'm just going to squish and mash this together. Like I said, if you don't like to get your hands dirty, use the food processor, but this just seems like an easier way to go. Yeah, it was vanilla. Thank you. Vanilla. So it's a little cream cheese, a little butter, uh, salt, the two flours. The oat flour is going to give a lot of flavor here. In this book, unlike other gluten-free books, I'm not using this all-purpose um, gluten-free flour blend. It's all about um, highlighting and celebrating the flavors of the actual interesting flowers. So in the oat chapter, you're going to have a whole lot of things with oats, oat flour or oats. And sometimes the oat flour will be a single flour, and sometimes it'll be paired with something. In this case, paired with rice, and rice is like the supporting cast. 
So as soon as this is all mushed and mashed together, who's made, made pastry before and liked a tart crust? This is like nothing you've ever done before, if you've done that before. So uh, does this look like, this doesn't look like any pastry. It doesn't look like a tart pastry. That's the beginning of it. OK, so let's just get it off of my hands. So obviously, we can't roll this out and fit it into the, pastry, into the uh, pan. So it's a, it's a, you know, usually we call this a press-in crust, but this is really actually more of a smear-in crust, right? You can see that that is, it's very good to be able to demonstrate this because sometimes for somebody who's used to baking, to describe this is harder than it, than once you see it, you get it completely. So you do with your hands whatever it takes to get this spread out. And it looks like not enough crust, right? It looks like a not enough, but it is exactly the right amount. So you aren't going to have any extra trimmings or anything like that. Your job is to get this pressed everywhere in here and up the sides as e evenly as possible. And with whatever it takes to do that job. I kind of challenge myself when I make this to do this as perfectly and evenly as possible because, as I said, when you're working with whole grains, you want that whatever pastry or cookie or whatever you're making to be fully toasted. And um, if the crust is uneven, the thin places are going to get overbaked before I get that full toasting on the rest. So like I said, I make it sort of a project to get this as smooth as and even as possible. And one trick is to realize that a lot of the extra dough tends to hide in the corners. So if you think you don't have enough dough, push your fingers in the corner, and you're going to find a whole lot more. And when you've got too much on one side, put it elsewhere. The real truth is I shorted the butter on this because we didn't have it. So now I've got that bigger challenge of making a teeny bit less of this go a little further. But it's still going to go there. And the other thing I want here is to make sure that this upper top edge is squared off. I don't want it tapering up against the pan side, because that's going to burn before everything gets baked. So this is, um, if you liked playing with clay or Play-Doh as a kid, this is your, this is your thing. <laughs> I mean, there are other press-in uh, crusts that are thicker and more um, forgiving, and you can just, this one is a little bit more finicky than that. So just when you think you can't possibly make this any better, there is a great trick for making it close to perfect, and I'll get to that in a second. Okay, so here's the rest of the procedure. So this is not to wrap it up. This is to kind of line it. So I'm going to press it across the bottom and into those corners. And then I'm going to finish smoothing this by tearing off a piece of paper towel and finding something that's got a nice square edge like this. And I'm just going to use it to press into the corners, smooth out the bottom. And this gets into the corners, so I'm not going to have a big, chunky um, in elegant corner. And why do I have the uh, paper towel in here? Anybody? The plastic, <laughs> plastic is sticky. You can't slide this. So this can make even what started out to be pretty rough, pretty smooth, and pretty even. And you can go back and fix up this edge. This type of crust, this type of dough, and many of these whole grain doughs benefit from at least a couple of hours of, of rest, if possible, or an overnight rest. So now you've got not only a pretty perfectly even crust, but it's all wrapped for the fridge. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, and to hydrate it, yes, that rest also, thank you, thank you, hydrates it, which is good because when the, those, um, especially the whole grains get hydrated, then they bake, they bake better, they bake more fully, and you don't get that sort of gritty tongue biting effect that you get from, a, from an undercooked whole grain. And you may not even know what I'm talking about, but if you've experimented with this kind of stuff, you've probably um, made a lot of tongue biting, gritty things. This will not be that. Um, you can bake this right away or you can refrigerate it. We happen to have baked one, so I'm gonna show you what that looks like. This can just go away. But anyway, I've gone for really uh, into the corners, straight up the sides and squared off. And whatever it takes to do that, I've spent, spent the time to do it. So either give it a rest or bake it. Um, so it goes into the oven and then at three, uh, 25. For those of you who bake, that sounds really low for a tart pastry. These um, whole grain, all other grain tart pastries and cookies tend to like to bake longer and slower. It gives it more time in the oven to get fully baked, get that hydrated dough fully baked at a lower temperature for longer. I tried when I did these recipes, I tried 350, 375, 325, and I compared. Um, I'm not a scientist, but I do know that if you do something long enough, if a monkey types long enough, a sentence might appear. So anyway, this is baked. It goes in the oven for about 15 minutes, and sometimes it poofs up a little bit. And at about the 15 minute mark, you can either press it down with the back of a fork, and if it's lost a little bit of shape, you can actually cheat and take the cup that you use to shape it and just kind of press it in the corners to reestablish shape. And so, um, when it's fully baked, it should have some really nice color. Pale pastry doesn't have flavor, and especially when we're talking about a whole grain, you want color. So after, um, this probably took, I don't know, recipe says 25, 35, 40, whatever it says. Then it comes out, and I painted it already with a little bit of um, egg yolk and salt. I painted it, put it back in the oven for two um, minutes. And the purpose of that is just to seal it because we're gonna put a kind of a wet filling in there. And also notice that I wouldn't, this is a pre-baked shell, but it's not partially baked. Even though we're putting a filling in there and it's gonna go back in the oven for 15 or 20 minutes, it's not gonna get any further baked. So don't think you're trying to partially bake. That's a big, big fault in baking. The idea of partially baked shells are, is usually wrong. You need to fully bake even if it's gonna go back in because the filling will prevent it from further baking. So, filling. I love this filling. I've done this filling with sour cream. I've done it with yogurt, which we're doing today. This is like a yogurt custard. It eats and feels like really light, smooth um, cheesecake, only with a tang and less fat and really a beautiful, suave kind of texture. And it starts with three eggs. And into that goes a little sugar, salt, and vanilla. OK, weird and interesting fact. And I thought about this before I came here, because I thought one of those Googlers is going to ask me why this is the truth, why this is so. And I'm not sure I can answer the question. But in this recipe, the smoothest filling is going to be gotten by putting the yolk, whisking the yogurt into the eggs, not the eggs into the yogurt. And it has something to do with the way things emulsify and which particular type of emulsion this is. And I don't think I can go further in the conversation than that. <laughs> it's not my area. But anyway, I do know from, for a fact that it's one into the other instead of the other into one. OK. Um, I'm trying to remember what this recipe called for. It's right over there if you want to look. <laughs> The recipe is specific, but it's plain unsweetened yogurt. And I'm sure that I've done it with, um, this is Greek. Is that what the recipe calls for? Good. That's what the recipe calls for. That's what we got. OK, so um, plain Greek yogurt. And I do go for pretty pure yogurt. I don't like a lot of additives. I just like the cultured stuff, you know, just the culturing stuff. I don't like any gelatin in there. OK, so let's get all of this stuff. I was about to say, I think I've done this with all levels. Um, and it's probably fine. It's not like a little more, you know, the difference between full fat yogurt and 
uh, low fat yogurt is very little and eggs are rich. I just don't think that fat is going to make a structural problem, meaning the, the recipe won't work. Um, it may taste a little differently. When you lower the fat a little, you get a little more tanginess, which I actually don't mind in a recipe like this. So anyway, this is really nice and smooth. And normally, you'd mix this together while the tart's baking and let it sit. Tart comes out of the oven. It's hot. You brush on the, the um, egg wash. It goes back in the oven for two minutes, remember? And it's still hot. Pretend it's still hot. I should use the gloves, right? <laughs> the gloves. And then this sort of beautiful ivory colored yogurt custard gets poured on there. And it goes back. In the meantime, you will have turned the oven down to 300. And you're just going to let this custard cook at this really low temperature, 300 degrees, until, and I actually am going to put it in the oven, until when you shake it in the pan like this, it jiggles like jello, but not stiff jello, kind of um, lazy jello, like it's starting to <laughs> set. <laughs> but it's, it's not rigid yet. And that makes the difference between something quite gorgeous and wonderful to eat and something less so. So I am going to stick this into the oven. And if this tart were hot, as it should be, the time it takes in the oven is somewhere between, I don't know, 10, 15, 20. It kind of depends on your oven. And you're going to be looking at it every now and then, giving it a little nudge to see how it, how it quivers. So I was going to ask if there's questions about that. Were there questions about that, or should we save them? Should I go on? I'll go on. So the next recipe that I wanted to do is this little gingerbread is made with the Cuisinart food processor. I love gingerbread. I also like buckwheat flour. This flour here is going to be buckwheat flour and brown rice flour. So it's totally whole grain, except for the fact that um, I'm going to let you do this because I'm fumbling with this. Totally whole grain, except for the fact that buckwheat isn't a true grain. It's called a, a pseudo cereal. It acts like a grain, and it looks like a grain, but it's actually a, it's neither a grain nor a grass. But anyway, we're going to treat it like a grain here. And we're going to start out with the brown rice. And we're gonna, again, we're going to give that little pre-mix thing so everything gets put together. Although, since it goes in the processor, I wonder why we're doing that. Brown rice, salt. A little baking soda, powdered ginger, and uh, allspice and cinnamon, and a tiny bit of xanthan gum. Who's worked with xanthan gum? Okay, tiny bit. Because there's no wheat, there's no gluten, there's no structure-producing proteins in this cake. Um, we're using a little xanthan, which is uh, it. it it makes things a little sticky. It makes them hold together. It's going to give you a cakier texture. It keeps things from falling apart. And it gets used in a lot of gluten-free baking. In this book, I made a big effort to find all the ways I could do a lot of recipes without it. Some people don't like to use it. Too much of it, um, I think too much, eating too much of it is not necessarily a good idea. The other thing, not because it can harm you, but because it, it, it's sort of like cement. You know, it holds things together. And a lot of the gluten-free recipes out there use so much of it that you end up with this sort of cement lump, lump in here. So in the experimentation for this book, we, um, anytime we needed to use xanthan gum, we kept decreasing the amount to see at what level we were getting the effect we wanted. Um, um, and if we lost that effect, we'd increase a little bit. So we cut this way, way down to about a quarter of a teaspoon. And sometimes then we just took it all out to make sure that we really needed it. In this case, we did. So there's just a little bit of it in there. In addition to the powdered ginger, I've got fresh ginger. And if you've not worked with fresh ginger before, it's, it smells wonderful and pungent and fantastic. And it's easiest to peel with a rounded spoon, edge of a spoon. Or you can use a vegetable peeler. We're just going to use um, 30 grams of this. So I might throw it on the scale. 
I gave an elaborate way to measure it without a scale. This book has measurements all in um, volume and grams. I think it's a good idea. It's a good thing to use if you've got grams or or ounces to do that and use that instead of uh, um, the volume. Every time, especially with dry ingredients and especially with flowers, every time you touch flour, every time you move it from one container to the next, every time you pour it, every time you touch it, you change how much of it fits in a cup. So there's no way to know how much you're putting in a cup compared to how much you're putting in a cup or you're putting in a cup. Because first of all, everybody packs the cup differently and everybody's handled the flour differently. So if we're all working with the same ounces or grams, at least that removes one of the variables that can make things go wrong. So when you're working with fresh ginger, even though I'm going to puree it, um, I want to reduce the amount of stringiness. And so the, the fibers are running this way, so I'm going to cut it in thin pieces to cut across those stringy grains. This is for any time you're, you're going to be chopping or pureeing or what have you. So we're doing, uh, let's see, on. I had a whole tutorial. Now it's off. Um. <laughs> OK, now. OK. Oh, it's teared. OK, good enough. Okay, so we're going for 30, uh, it's changing a lot here. <laughs> that's it, that's it, that's it. All right. So, food processor, the ginger with the brown sugar. And if we leave that on for a few seconds, it's gonna turn into puree. So even if you're doing a dish that gets chopped ginger, if you slice across the grain first before you chop, you're going to reduce the amount of stringiness that you get in there. Good little tip. When you're doing savory cooking, some of that doesn't matter. You're just cutting a coin and putting it in the wok or whatever and getting flavor. The same is true about peeling. A lot of savory cooks, especially, especially Asian um, chefs, won't peel ginger. Other people do. Some people don't. But I think for something like dessert, I, want, I don't want the peels in there. So here's the puree. Okay. Here's the puree. I'm going to melt some butter. Forgot that here. It's a little bit of melted butter. This gets um, pan preparation is important, and different pans, different recipes seem to require a different kind of pan preparation. Sometimes it's grease, sometimes it's grease and flour. It all depends on what kind of surface you want or how that particular batter releases from the side of the cake. So I'm not a one size, a one prep suits all recipe person. Every one of my cakes has a different pan preparation. I sometimes have to look at the recipe myself to get reminded what I've chosen because there's usually a good reason for it. No matter what I do, however, there's always a circle of parchment paper in the bottom. That ensures that no matter what, this cake is coming out of the pan because you can always, you can always release the sides. And if you can release the sides and flip it out, because if the sides are stick, you can always run a spatula around that, no problem. But you can't do anything about the bottom. But if you've got paper there, um, you always have a way to get the cake out. Some chefs and uh, cooking teachers will grease the pan, put in the parchment, and then grease the parchment. Oh. Really? I, that to me just is overkill. I just put the paper in there, put the cake batter in there. When the cake comes out, the paper is attached to the cake. I peel it off the cake. That saves me a whole lot of, of, of fooling around. OK, we do have hot butter now. <laughs> um, so the premixed flour is going into the puree here. This was the brown rice flour with the um, Salt and leavening and spices. So where do you source your flowers from? I you know I order some from I buy some from Bob's Red Mill. I like also authentic foods, which I have to get online. The reason I like authentic foods is because of, of, of the flowers that they make. They're finer. Uh, they make brown rice, white rice, sorghum, and corn, and they're just a little bit finer. So it gives you some more opportunities to get really refined textures, even out of whole grains. And that's, I think, really part of the fun of doing something in a dessert with whole grains where people don't expect them, and having them turn out in refined and elegant as opposed to kind of hippie rustic. 
which I also like, but okay. So in, in the molasses goes in here. And the egg and the butter, which I hope is not too hot to cook the egg, so I'll pour it over here. Warm butter was, was called for, but um, this will be fine. Now you're wondering maybe, maybe you're wondering why this rest of this flour isn't going in here. There's a weird tricky thing going on with this recipe, easy to mix. Um, because of the xanthan gum, I'm going to just blend this when I find the top about 15 seconds. If I over blend it, at some point that gum is going to lose its hold. And I'm not actually sure how many seconds out that is. So when I say mix for 20 seconds or 15 seconds, I kind of want you to watch the clock. Can somebody do that? <laughs> oh, we've got that many seconds, huh? That's slow. We're done? Okay. So then the other tricky part of this, there's the xanthan, which I don't want to overmix. And then there's the buckwheat flour, which has a really weird property, which is if you mix it, even in a pan or even if you're cooking it as porridge and you mix it too much, it goes to complete mush, like cement. Anybody done that? Yeah? So I don't want that in there the whole full 15 seconds. I want it in at the very end. Um, and it goes in with a little bit of hot water, which I'm going to measure in this wonderful little pre-measured thing <laughs> that we marked. So hot water from the tap is fine. Okay. And it's a half a cup. We didn't have a little cup measure, so we uh, marked off a thing. So hot water and the buckwheat. And I'm just going to give it like five seconds just to blend it in there. Quirk, like I said, quirky little. Quirky little procedures for some of this uh, use, using some of these different flours. So it's a very liquid batter. I've made muffins and cupcakes out of, or, you know, muffins out of it. The pan called for in the recipe is eight inch, and this is nine. Normally, I'm a stickler for the pan, the right size pan, but this just means that it's going to bake in less time, right? It's thinner. It's going to bake in less time. Okay. Let's get a spatula here. So the buckwheat turned out to be one of the most interesting of all of the grains, not grains, that I worked with. I worked with a co-author who lived in Portland, who lives in Portland. And you might wonder how you could do a collaboration like this with somebody so far away. Uh, we had worked together for many years. She knows my palate. She, I know her palate. And we suddenly discovered, this goes in the oven, and that's all there is to it, really. We suddenly discovered at a certain point when I was in a jam with a book deadline. And I thought since she'd moved away, we could never work again. I called her up and I said, I'm in deep doo-doo. I need, what are you doing? She said, not so much right now. I said, could you try this, 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 and this? And what do you think about this? And we found out that we could work together after all of those years. So when this book came along, I knew that we could do this at long distance. Um, because we think alike and differently. There's a great overlap in our, uh, and yet we have some of the same problem solving skills. So we're working on buckwheat, which we both like a lot. And she's doing a whole one set of recipes, and I'm doing another, but all with buckwheat. We're exploring buckwheat. We're trying to figure out what broccoli will do and how it tastes and what the texture is. And I call her up one day. We have these long, long, long check in collaboration, you know, sort of meetings on the phone. And I call her up one day. And I say, oh my god, I'm getting these beautiful, floral, fragrant, light flavors and textures unlike anything. I mean, if you've eaten buckwheat before, it's pretty earthy, right? It's kasha, it's soba, it's, uh, it's not gentle, and it's not floral. So I was so excited about all these flavors and textures. She said, well, that's good, because I'm getting cement here. <laughs> And we're talking about this. She's getting cement. Nothing is tasting good. And we talk and talk and talk. And then we go away. We get off the phone. We haven't solved anything. 
And she decides that it's the fineness of the flour that's causing a problem and giving her these mushy cement-like textures. So she goes off and buys some buckwheat in the bulk bin and grinds it up to a coarse meal and makes her cake all over again. And it is suddenly fantastic. I, in the meantime, am thinking more and more about what's happening to her and why it isn't happening to me. And I stumble on, the, re stumble on information that when you stir buckwheat too much, you get mush. And I realize the cake she's working on takes a lot of beating. It's just that kind of cake. It's like a butter cake, lots of beating. The cakes I'm working on are sponge cakes, gentle folding. So, of course, she's getting mush, and I'm getting, because she's, um, you know, she's uh, activating the mush factor. And, but in the meantime, we both came to sort of different solutions to the same pro problem. It made that chapter the, one of the most interesting in the book because there's a lot of different textures and um, different kinds of recipes using buckwheat because of that whole problem solving, you know, the way in which we're, the, we're both the same and, and different. Um, it was really one of the best parts of collaborating. I have done what I came here to do. If there are, at least in terms of baking, are there questions or comments or anywhere you want to go with this? Yes. How long do these flours last in the cupboard? Oh, yeah. A lot of them are whole grains. So you would treat them like you would treat whole wheat. And um, if you use them all the time, don't buy more than you can use in a certain amount of time. I, I look at the sell-by dates, because nobody can sell a flour that's going to go bad the next, you know. You've got a few, you've got two or three or four months after the sell-by date if it's packaged. Um, longer if it's in the fridge or in the freezer. I do sort of address this in the book, too. People are always asking this. And it's kind of a best guess. I mean, you should learn to, to sniff the flowers when you open a bag, um, especially when it's fresh. It gets you used to what fresh flour smells like so that when it goes rancid, you'll know. But yeah, you have longer than you think. And if, you, if you're using something that uh, you're not using very often, maybe the freezer is the best place to, to put that. One of the things that's fun about this book is you don't have to go out and buy all these flowers to begin with. You can start out with, like if you're interested in the buckwheat, get the buckwheat flour and get some rice flour. And you can practically do everything in that chapter with either buckwheat alone or buckwheat and rice. There's a couple of you know, dog legs from there. But so you can, um, you can explore them flower by flower. Somebody else? I, I have a quick one. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned a lot that the buckwheat gets really concrete and <laughs> terrible. And honestly, I'm intrigued, like why why that might be. And I know you hate those oh, why to, questions. No, no, no. I do love I love the whys. I love the whys um, when there's something I can answer. Yeah. That, you know, I don't actually know. We sort of went right into problem solving mode yeah. and didn't stop with saying, well, why is that happening? Um, I don't know. But if anybody ever makes kasha, does anybody make kasha? Anybody grow up with kasha? a beloved and detested Jewish Russian dish that you know some of us grew up with and some of us liked and some of us did not. But if you stir, the, and there's a step in there where you take the grain and you toast it in the pan coated with some egg, and I think that, and then you steam it like rice. And I think that coating with egg helps to prevent those little particles from becoming mushy. But the last time I saw that made was so long ago, and I was probably a kid, and I don't remember that. So I never researched that mushy thing. And does it do anything to the flavor? Um, which? What? Uh, the over-stirring the buckwheat. Well, you know, if it's going to take, I, I'm a big believer that texture affects flavor. Because if you're eating something that feels like cement in your mouth, you're, eh, you're not likely. Um, does it do something to flavor? Uh, maybe not necessarily. Although in the case of what she made, it certainly did, because those lovely floral fragrant flavors didn't come out until she had something light. So perhaps yes. Could you speak to some of the nutritional differences between these whole grains and whole wheat flour? Um, that, I'm not, you know, in general, I can say in general, the reason we like whole grains is that there's some nutritional value in there, right? There's, there's the heart healthy aspect of it. It's good for cholesterol. It's got fiber. It's got protein. And in general, when we're talking about whole grains, we're comparing them with um, refined grains where they've taken away the, the fiber coating, you know, the, what is it, the, um, the, the bran and the germ, which has got the protein in it. So, Specifically compared to whole wheat, I'd have to look it up. And you can probably look those things up um, flower by flower, and they probably all differ a little bit. Yeah, I don't know if that would, got close to an answer, but. Um, 
More benefits, yeah. And I mean, in a way, and, and my goal here was not to make healthy food. My goal was to, because I'm a chef, I'm all about the delicious. And I love, and I also like the unexpected, and I'm sort of open to different take, to, uh, flavors and textures. And I love using, I love, the, I, I love the flavor of whole grains in cereals, in breads, and all of those things. And it's intriguing to me to bring it into the world of pastry because it's unexpected and because it's not that I'm trying to hide it. It's not a stealth thing or I'm trying to trick the kids into eating their peas. It's just because that's the sort of creative, I mean, that's my sort of creative drive is to make something delicious in an unexpected way. You mentioned in the book uh, chestnut flour sourcing and being able to find a source that does not have a smoky quality to yeah. it. What causes a smoky quality? Um, they, Is it like rice? They roast or dry them over um. Uh, um, some form of fire that's got smoke. And it, it may even be something that's liked in Italy because I think the Italians tend to have a bit of that smoke, but not all of them. Um, I just don't find that delicious for all the dessert things that I made. And I did find a source, an American source of oh, two of them, actually. One of them especially good the Allen Creek Farms that you can buy online some chestnut flour from in season and it's only sort of seasonal. Yeah? Another? Oh, Hi, another? Um, Hi. I was wondering what if you have a favorite flour. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I love the buckwheat. I, and by the way, this gingerbread is more on the rust, on the sort of robust and earthy flavor side, not on the fragrant, you know, floral side. I love the buckwheat for all the different things it does. I'm crazy about corn flour. I mean, everybody knows what cornbread is, but as soon as you have flour that's finer than cornmeal, you can do all of, you can make a chiffon cake out of it that is golden and beautiful and really quite delicious. So I'm, I love the corn. And the oats to me taste a little bit like, um, like uh, have a caramelly note to it. So I have a follow up to that, which is, were there any flours that you tried that were just completely unsuitable for baking? <laughs> No, we kind of honed on these ones pretty quickly because between us we kind of knew what we liked. Millet, I like the flavor of millet flour, but I, um, and I would use that next if I, there's any follow up. I love the flavor of millet, but every now and then millet gets really bitter in my mouth and I never did solve that. And we quickly moved on to some other flours that we agreed we wanted to work with. So poor millet got left behind. Yes. So is there any benefit in milling your own grains milling as opposed your own. to buying People flour? People say, and I, I'm, I'm sure that this is true, that if you mill your own, you get this amazing, amazing flour. I, I know that bread bakers believe that, and I'm sure that it's true. And it's prob it would be probably true for what I've done here, too. Um, because the agenda in this book was so big, we decided not to just like go over there and do that too. But I started to experiment a little bit with that after I published the book to see what the great fuss was about. And I found that no matter what I did, I couldn't get flowers as fine as the commercially milled ones. And I do, it's not that I want everything to be really fine and fluffy. You'll see that these are not particularly fine and fluffy. But I really value having some of these grains in a really fine flour form. So I didn't follow up too, too, too much. Has anybody milled their own? I've been trying some things inspired by your book, actually. Oh, thank you. On, um, trying different grains and going through a bunch of them, but some of it's been to experiment with mochi making. Um, with what making? <laughs> mochi making. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, and just trying to find some balance with that. But I, I, in general, I just kind of liked the idea of being able to try textures. I knew that I probably wouldn't be able to get it as right. fine. Yeah. But I mean, um, sometimes you want a coarser texture, yeah. right? I mean, there's the buckwheat thing that she did was good proof of that. I was just wondering if you could go through one of the creative processes of your recipes, maybe a favorite one. I'm curious uh, how yeah. these um, things come about. So when I started this project, I actually knew very little about these flowers. I had, I had done a few little things with these flowers in conjunction with wheat, and I knew I was interested in the flavor because I knew that they were enhancing to the things that I did with the wheat. And I really hadn't done much without any wheat at all. So I was starting with that sort of blank slate kind of thing with this great idea, and I thought there would be a, might be a book in this. And I also knew that there was a great advantage to coming at something without having been fully steeped in it, educated in it, trained in it, because then you get trained in the way. And I knew I didn't want to do it the way that it was being done because I hadn't tasted anything very tasty the way it had been done. So, so it was a blank slate. And the first thing I thought of was, how am I going to get structured? Do we always have to use xanthan gum? And um, 
I thought, I wonder if a recipe that's heavy in eggs and that gets its structure from eggs anyway might work with these flours without any gum. And so I had the most amazing beginner's luck. It was a, it was a, a few weeks before somebody, a freelance writer from the Wall Street Journal called up and she said, can I come, I'm writing a story about the creative process, can I come and follow you around for a day? And I thought, oh my God, oh my God, what will I do with this one? Uh, I thought, okay, okay, I'll do some of my experiments for this, this project. I'll invite her, and if they work, fine. If they don't, it's part of the creative process. So she comes over, and my idea is to take a, sponge, a really basic, easy French sponge cake, five ingredients, I could do it in my sleep really fast, and test the idea of whether a sponge cake with, that gets its structure from egg could work with all of these flowers. And in front of her, or maybe I did some in advance, but. I made, I picked about five flowers and I made this sponge cake and they all worked. They all, they all worked. Um, maybe some of them needed a little tweak here and there, but clearly they're the structure from the eggs. And that led me to thinking, um, it also gave me a way to taste these grains as single grains in each cake. I didn't blend or anything. And it also led me to think, OK, any time a recipe already has enough eggs in it to give structure, these grains might work. These flowers might work. So it led me the whole family of sponge cakes, which includes chiffon cakes, anything that is powered by eggs. And on Maya's side of the ledger up there in Portland, she had been realizing that, how, that recipes that had eggs, if you be, start out by beating them, a lot, you get more structure from them. So it was like one thing led to another. You know, there were some dead ends, and I can't even remember what some of those were right now, but there were some really good lucky breaks. Can you say how much work's involved in something, a book like this? Did you, <laughs> I mean, did Never you have, made so did, many bad pastries in my life. No, I know. Special do you have assistants or do you do all the cooking? Uh, no, she and I did it ourselves. That's yeah, impressive. Yeah. You, you sort of can't afford assistance if you're really just a book writer. <laughs> it depends. I mean, if you have a whole day job and a whole business going on on the side, it's a little different. But, but even for Coco, I did it myself. You know, I did it myself because it was meant to be for a home cook, and you can't apply what goes on in the bakery to, to what goes on in a home cook kitchen. So thanks everyone for coming out today and I want to especially extend a thank you to Alice for being here, sharing her expertise, sharing these recipes. So uh, thank you again. Thank you, thank you. <laughs>